In this video we'll look at the Heathkit GD125Q multiplier. I'll review the history of the unit and its features and take a look at it inside and out. I'll discuss the restoration of this particular unit and demonstrate it being operated. Almost unheard of in these days of crystal filters and DSP radios, a Q multiplier is a circuit that improves the selectivity of a receiver. For narrow bandwidth signals like CW, this could allow you to hear the one signal you're interested in and filter out the others. Typically present in the IF amplifier stage of a radio, it provides either a band pass or band reject filter function with variable frequency and depth. It uses regeneration to increase the effective Q of the filter circuit. In band pass or peak mode, the Q multiplier passes a narrow band of frequencies and rejects others, allowing you to separate a single signal in a crowded band. In band reject or notch mode, it filters out a narrow band of frequencies, typically to allow removing an unwanted signal that's interfering with the one being listened to. If you turn the regeneration up high enough, the circuit will oscillate, allowing it to also be used as a beat frequency oscillator. A Q multiplier is typically quite sensitive to adjust and takes some practice and experience to use. They were standard on some high-end radios like this Hammerland HQ110, or were optional add-ons for lower cost receivers. Heathkit offered a number of Q multipliers over the years. The QF1 offered from 1956 to 1960 at a price of $9.95 was Heathkit's first Q multiplier. It was intended for use with the Heathkit AR1, 2, and 3 receivers, although it could be used with most radios that used a 455 kHz IF frequency. Housed in a metal case, it needed to obtain its filament and B-plus power from the receiver it was attached to. The AR series of receivers provided an octal plug on the back for this. Other radios could be easily modified. The HD11, offered from 1961 to 1964 at a price of $14.95, used the same basic circuit but included a built-in AC power supply. The HD11 was replaced by the GD125 in 1966, which initially sold for $14.95 and was offered until 1971. It was essentially the same as the HD11 but repackaged in a different case and color scheme to better match Heathkit receivers like the GR64. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. The mode switch selects between off, peak, null, and broad. When off, the attached receiver operated normally as if the Q multiplier was not present. In peak mode, it operates as a narrow bandpass filter. The peak control adjusts the level of regeneration and therefore the width of the filter. The tuning control adjusts the center frequency of the filter around the receiver's IF frequency. In null mode, it operates as a band reject filter with the depth of the peak controlled by the notch depth control and the center frequency by the tuning control. Broad mode is similar to peak mode but the filter has a wider bandwidth. On the rear panel is the AC power cord and a phono jack that connects to the radio receiver. Inside you can see that there's not a lot of circuitry but with the small case it's still quite tightly packed. Tuning is performed with this variable capacitor with vernier drive. Other front panel controls are the rotary mode switch and potentiometers for notch, depth, and peak. It uses a single 12 AX7 tube. Here's the power transformer and filter cap. There are two inductors which need to be adjusted. I'll cover the alignment procedure later. The GD125 could be used with most receivers that use a 455 kHz IF frequency. For radios like the GR64 that provided a Q multiplier connection, you simply connected it to the unit using a small coax cable. 
it needs to be aligned with the receiver that it's used with. The first adjustment is for the compensation for the cable. When the unit is attached to the radio but switched off, inductor L1 is adjusted for maximum reading on the receiver's S meter when tuned to a station. The other adjustment is to center the tuning at the IF frequency of the radio. This needs to be done with the cover off to gain access to inductor L2. But removing the cover affects the tuning. The trick to solve this problem, as described in the manual, is to perform the alignment with the cover removed but sitting on top of the unit. In null mode, with the radio tuned to a station, L2 is adjusted so that a null is obtained with the tuning control centered. I noticed that the power supply uses filter caps rated at 150 volts DC and the voltage on them at 117 volts AC line input is about 150 volts DC and even higher with today's typical 120 volts AC input. So the caps were run at or slightly over spec. I had been looking for some time for a GD125 at a reasonable price to go with my Heathkit GR64 receiver. This one was acquired on eBay in June 2014. When received, it looked in good condition and powered up fine, initially using a Variac. It came without a manual or cables, but I found some partial manuals and schematics on the internet. I made a coax cable with a phono jack on one end and tin wires to go to the radio screw terminals on the other. The soldering workmanship on this unit is not particularly great, although it looks a little cramped to work on. I did not replace the filter caps as they seemed good, although I may do that in the future. Strangely enough, the top cover of the case was on backwards. I cleaned the switch and controls and tested and aligned it with my GR64 receiver. It appears to be working quite well. I'm going to give a short demonstration of the Q multiplier hooked up to a Heathkit GR64 shortwave receiver, which was the main receiver that this was designed to be used with. So the phono jack on the back of the Q multiplier is connected with a cable to the Q multiplier screw terminal on the back of the radio. I've also hooked the radio up to an external shortwave antenna. As a demonstration of a peak mode, we'll listen to a short wave station. Starting in the broad mode, we can see that the tuning is uh, quite broad and adjusting the tuning control doesn't really have too much effect on the tuning of the signal. Now if we were to turn the peak control up far enough, uh, we'll get enough regeneration that it will actually oscillate and start acting like a beat frequency oscillator. Now if we move to peak mode, we have a much sharper filter and we can see as we move the tuning control we get much sharper tuning. And if we turn up the peak control the tuning should get even sharper. Muy grave porque eh, continúan los enfrentamientos. Es el dale, o sea, la respuesta, la acción y la respuesta. La acción y la respuesta. Y en definitiva, bueno, pues eh, quién da primero, quién da al final. Ese realmente... As a demonstration of a null or notch mode, I'm listening to some amateur radio CW signals. There's several signals appearing because they're so close together. Using the, um, adjusting the tuning control, I can notch out a signal and uh, effectively make it go away. Let's we'll see if you can hear that.
And finally, turning the Q multiplier off, the radio then reverts to normal operation, other than possibly a little bit of detuning uh, that's caused uh, when the unit is turned off. Nunca nos ponemos de acuerdo en este tipo de noticias, pero me alegro mucho que usted traiga esta nota para el cierre porque yo comienzo con algo que tiene que ver con la tecnología, pero en la tecnología... Bob Eckweiler writes a monthly column for the Orange County Amateur Radio Club called Heathkit of the Month. The December 2010 issue, available online, has a nice article about the Heathkit QF1 Q multiplier, which is almost identical to the GD125. It provides a good explanation of the circuit and theory of operation. The GD125Q multiplier was an optional add-on for receivers like the GR64 that improved the selectivity of the radio, making it more suitable for use on amateur radio bands where signals tend to be more crowded together than on the shortwave broadcast bands. By making it an option, they kept the price of the receiver down and provided an opportunity to upsell the customer, possibly at a later date after the radio purchase. It's not clear how many people opted for it, but these units are relatively rare. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage amateur radio and test equipment.